Well, as I said, uh, I hope you have your Bible. If you do so, uh, I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 1 this evening. 1 John chapter 1. I want to talk to you about a new normal. Uh, They're saying that going forward, following this pandemic, that uh, we are going to be entering into a new normal, whatever that might mean. Maybe it means Uh, We will be frequently wearing face masks, or we'll be social distancing again at times, or there'll be stricter nursing home visitation regulations. I want to talk about a new normal in the spiritual realm. And you know what that is? The new normal that I want to talk about is walking with God. You say, that's a new normal? I think to most Christians it is. You know what? Honestly now, can you stay there, can you sit there tonight and say that you're walking with God? And yet walking with God is so much a part of the biblical narrative. It begins with Adam walking with God in the cool of the evening in the Garden of Eden. Enoch walked with God. God took him. Noah walked with God. And on and on, biblical characters walk with God. You get to the New Testament, and one of the greatest uh, pictures of the Christian life is a walk. It's walking with God. For example, I'm thinking of Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, that we walk not after the flesh, but we walk in in the spirit. I'm thinking of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, and we walk by faith and not by sight. Or how about Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, walk in the spirit. Or uh, that same passage, Galatians 5 verse 25, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Or Ephesians 4, verse 1, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Or Ephesians 4, 17, walk not as other Gentiles or pagans walk. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love as Christ also loved us. Ephesians 5, 8, walk in, in light as the children of light. Or Ephesians 5.16, walk circumspectly or carefully. Colossians 2, verse 6, as ye have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk ye in him. Or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1, you have learned how you ought to walk. Or 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, that we are so to walk even as he, meaning Jesus, walked. You know, I've taken up walking uh, recently, and uh, I make it a habit now to walk every day. And uh, I walk as long as it takes me to pray. And uh, I never really walked and prayed before, but I've been training myself to pray while I walk. Usually I would get distracted. I'd look at this. I'd look at that. Sometimes I still do. But I walk and I pray. And uh, I'm thinking, I wonder how many steps I'm taking. Now, I know you can get a Fitbit or a Garmin and it will count your steps. And I, I don't care about that. But I've wondered how many steps I'm taking. Because when you think about it, walking is just taking one step after another step. And so I want to talk to you tonight, I want to talk to you about a new norm, perhaps for you, and that is walking with God. Let's pray. So our Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful that we can have this time together in your word. I thank you for this emphasis of the scripture of walking with you. This is what our life really ought to amount to. This is what we're here for, to walk with you and all that that entails. And I pray that you'll shed light on that and that you'll lead us into this new normal uh, going forward to walk with God, really walk with you as others have and as others are. So Lord, open our eyes tonight. Use this message 
Make it simple, yet make it profound for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So my first uh, point that I want to share with you is a step-by-step walk. When we talk about a step-by-step walk, we're talking about a moment-by-moment activity. In other words, all that matters when it comes to walking with God is the next step, the next moment. All that matters when we walk with God is that, uh, that we are mainly focused on the present. We are not focused on the past or even the future. In fact, the Bible tells us, Paul says, if you want to walk correctly, if you really want to walk with God, you have to forget those things which are behind so that you can press forward toward the mark. And so you have to forget the things behind. One of the things that I would say that need to be forgotten and left behind is your past successes. You need to forget past success. Uh, you, you don't focus on what you accomplished in the past. You know, sometimes we've had some great times of victory in our lives. At least I hope we have. But you can't live off of the past successes. You can't focus on uh, what you accomplished or what God accomplished through you in the past. To make too much of your past spiritual experience is really an excuse often for your current inconsistencies in your Christian life. And, uh, and so don't base your current walk on past spiritual victories. It's a step-by-step walk, and so you have to let go of the past successes, but also, just as important, you can't focus on your past failures. I believe that Satan, who, who is our enemy, has as one of his favorite weapons a false guilt that he brings into the life of believers that causes them to focus their attention on their former sins. And when you do that, that will cripple your walk with God. You cannot live there. The Holy Spirit wants you to focus upon Christ, and He wants to give you hope. In fact, you know, there's a difference between the false guilt about former sins that the devil brings into your life versus the conviction of the Holy Spirit about present sins. The enemy will condemn you by bringing up former sins into your memory and, uh, and taunt you with that and say, how can you ever amount to anything for God? Because look at what you did then. Look at, uh, look at what you are. That's what you were. That's not what you are. And so the enemy condemns you, gives you a feeling of hopelessness that, what's the use? The conviction of the Holy Spirit is totally different. The Holy Spirit will convict you at the moment that you step one step into darkness, and he will make it specific, but he'll also with that give you hope that you can be forgiven. Big difference. So to walk step by step, is to forget the past, the past successes, the past failure, and it is also to walk step by step is to deal with present sin. The moment that you step into any kind of darkness whatsoever, the Holy Spirit immediately points to it and then directs you back into the light and under the blood so that you can continue to walk with him. There's a second thing that I want to talk about regarding the believer's walk, this new norm that uh, I want us to really get a hold of is not only a step-by-step walk, but having a limp in your walk. You say, what do you mean by that? I'm talking about, let me give you a biblical example. You remember Jacob? when he was about to meet his brother Esau, and he wrestled with the angel of the Lord on that riverbank. And in that struggle, the angel of the Lord finally touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and put it out of joint. 
And the Bible says that after that incident, that Jacob walked with a limp. And that limp was really symbolic of God's touch in a strong-willed man's life that brought brokenness to him. And so when I talk about a limp in your step, I'm talking about a brokenness in your life before God. You know, I'm finding also that in walking, uh, at my age, I'm having a little hip pain. And that hip pain reminds me, it reminds me of Jacob, and God uses that to remind me of my need to daily be broken before the Lord. You know, only a broken Savior saves us. Paul said that the night that he was he was betrayed. He took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. So it's a broken Savior that saves us when he gives his body and his life and his blood on that tree for us. And you know, it's only a broken sinner that becomes the recipient of his salvation. Do you remember the brokenness of that of that, uh, that uh, prison warden in Acts 16 when there's an earthquake and he fears that all the prisoners have escaped and so he would be executed by his superiors and he's about to commit suicide and Paul cries out and says, stop, don't do it. We're all here. And that, uh, that uh, Philippian jailer, he comes before Paul and Silas and he falls down on his knees and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul's simple answer is the answer perhaps that you need to receive tonight, and that is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And he was, and he did. And, we, uh, and he, was, he, he was a broken man at that point. And in his brokenness, he became the recipient of salvation. You need, if you're a believer, if you're not already, you need to become a broken saint. You need to become a broken believer. The psalmist David, in the repentance of his sin, says that he has come to recognize that the sacrifices are God are not animal sacrifices. That's not so much what God wants. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. He said God will not despise that. We need to learn as believers to live in constant brokenness in our relationship. In our relationship, first of all, before the Lord. Our heart toward God needs to be a broken, a rent heart, a torn heart. Think of your life as a house. If, you, if your life is a house, then if you are broken before God, the roof will be off, and you'll have that vertical relationship with God of repentance and faith. That's what a brokenness before God looks like. It's a repentant heart that's full of faith in the Lord. But a broken believer is not also broken before God, but is also broken with his brothers, with other believers. We are to not only believe in our heart, but we are to confess with our mouth, express with our mouth. To, bro to be broken before God is to have a heart toward God. To be broken with your brothers is to express with your mouth. Think again, your life is a house. The roof is off. You're, you're broken before God. You're in relationship with Him, but the walls are down. And horizontally, you have a transparency with your brothers in the Lord. There's something important about opening up and sharing verbally the real condition of your heart with one another, with brothers and sisters in the Lord. 
I think that it, that it is of vital importance that believers learn to live transparent lives with one another, not trying to impress one another or fool each other into thinking that we are more spiritual than we actually are, broken with our brethren. You know, I think that that is probably one of the reasons why the book of Psalms is such a valued book of the Bible. And that is because you and I, as human beings, identify with someone like the psalmist who is so honest about his, his experience. Sometimes he's upset with people. Sometimes the psalmist is upset at God. And he's just honest and transparent. And it... it, it it's really the evidence of someone who is broken, and God meets that kind of a person, and he lifts them up. God lifts broken people and comforts them, and that's the way to live the new norm, to have a step-by-step -step walk with the Lord and also to have a limp in your step. And there's third and final thing that I want to share with you tonight about this, walking with God, not only that it's step-by-step, step, limp, brokenness, but there ought to also be a spring in your step. And I take you to 1 John chapter 1, and in that, uh, that uh, fourth verse, he says, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. He talks about walking with the Lord, walking in the light, in this first chapter of John. And so a spring in your step is walking with God in humble brokenness before God and with others, and you know what the result is going to be? A fullness of joy, an overflowing joy. That is the normal Christian life. And if you're not living it, if you don't have overflowing joy tonight, you can you can have this kind of new norm, if I could call it that. You know what kills joy? You know what the joy killer is in the Christian life? I find that most believers, really, if they're honest, don't have a spring in their step. But their, their lives, even as Christians, feel empty and dry and hardened and fearful and, and worrisome and, and full of turmoil. Why is that? There's only one answer. There's only one reason why we lose the spring in our step and our walk with God, and that is sin robs us. Sin robs our joy. He says in that sixth verse of 1 John chapter 1, if we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You know what darkness represents in that verse? Darkness represents a refusal to admit and or to agree with, God, with, with what God says about you. That's to walk in darkness. You know, it's less convicting to use different terms to explain the sin in our life. For instance, sometimes we can soft soap it by calling impatience and irritability, oh, it's just a stress in my life. I'm just stressed out. Or harsh and sharp tones that we speak in, oh, it's, it's because I'm under a lot of pressure. Or uh, the anxiety and the fear that uh, we contain in our heart, oh, it's just that I, I'm, I'm just heavily burdened about this. Or sometimes bitterness and an unforgiving spirit, oh, because I've been so deeply hurt, you understand. And whenever we make these kinds of excuses, sin will rob us of this overflowing joy that is talked about here in that fourth verse in our walk. We will not have a spring in our step. But you know what? The answer is found in verse 5. This then is the message which ye have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. 
You want a spring in your step? If you don't have it, you need a new norm. And that spring in the step is taken from you through sin. Sin robbed you of that joy. But in verse 5 of 1 John chapter 1, sin is exposed by God who is light. You know what light is for? You know how light functions? Light is inescapable, and it functions to reveal things as they really are. You know, if it's dark at night and you get up to uh, use the bathroom and you stumble over something and stub your toe, you might think that you stumbled over the leg of a, of a table, but uh, when it's morning and you look, you realize, oh, that wasn't the table at all. That was uh, the dresser or whatever. Light reveals things as they really are. And God is light. And uh, so we're not, you know what? If you're walking with the Lord, you're not a person that is constantly looking within. You're not a person that is, uh, is uh, introspective and, uh, and morbidly uh, self-examining yourself all the time. You don't have to do that. If you're walking with the Lord, it's a step-by-step -step walk with Him, and when you lose the spring in your step, when you put one foot into darkness, God who is light is going to reveal that to you. Then what? Then what? I want you to see verse 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, sin's the joy killer. Jesus is the joy giver. And that's what I see in that ninth verse. The light of Jesus reveals the sin in our life that has killed our joy, and Jesus is the cure. Notice it says in the ninth verse, if we confess that word confess means to say with. In other words, to say what another person says. And in this case, the person is God. It, to confess is simply this. God, if you say that sin, so do I. That's your part. When it comes to dealing with this matter of sin that robs you of that spring in your step, your part is simply to confess. It's simply to say, God, if you say it's sin, I agree. What's God's part? The rest of the verse says that if you confess, you know what he's going to do? He's going to cleanse. He's going to forgive. And it's a promise here. God's part is a promise to you. And it's almost automatic. When you confess, you walk in the light. When you confess your sin, when you agree with God about it, he cancels it out by the blood of Jesus. It, it, you see, your confession activates Jesus' forgiveness and his purifying blood for you that was sacrificed for you. Corey Ten Boom, in her autobiography, The Hiding Place, said, the blood of Jesus never cleansed an excuse. If we hide behind excuses, we'll neither sense his forgiveness nor gain the victory over that evil in our life. But when we humbly agree with God, we step out of the darkness into the light, and we just depend upon Jesus then for his cleansing, as he promised. When you believe Jesus for cleansing, you know what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit is going to witness in your heart that you're clean and that you're in step with the Lord. And that's the new norm that we need now and that we need to continually live in. And that's what I'm talking about. Walk with the Lord. Walk in step, step by step. Walk with that limp in your step. That humble brokenness before the Lord and before others. Walk with that spring in your step. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the ability that we have. It's a privilege to be able to walk with you. 
Lord, teach us, teach us the simplicity of this. When we were little toddlers, we learned to walk physically. And now we do it without even thinking. Lord, would you make spiritual walking second nature to us like that? That we would just learn to walk with you and that we would uh, be able to enjoy the kind of fellowship with you like we've never had before. Lead us into this new norm as we walk. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close tonight with one last song. Uh, it's called, For Me to Live is Christ and to Die is Gain. It's 458 for those of you in the song. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. To know His Word and walk His narrow way. No joy, no thrill, like walking in His will for me to live, is Christ to die is gain. Once my heart was full of sin and shame, till someone told me Jesus came to save. When He said, come unto me, He set my poor heart free for me to Uh, that the pianist just play quietly a little bit and then I'm going to close in prayer. Just take this time really to focus on the Lord. I know we normally pray together on a Wednesday night so we don't want to just turn off and get back to life. Let's really take this time to seek the Lord. Uh, join me in prayer and just quiet your heart before Him. God, I thank You so much for the message from your word tonight. Lord, I thank you very much that you don't want us to focus on our past sins. Lord, you have cleansed us from those things. And we don't have to live in defeat. We don't have to live uh, crippled by this sin that you've already forgiven and cleansed us of. And I know so often the devil even throws this at me and tempts me to think of things that I have done in my past and causes me to live in defeat. But Lord, we thank you so much for your conviction which leads us to Jesus for complete forgiveness. And then you forgive and cleanse completely. And I thank you so much for that. Lord, I ask that we would be broken and humble before you, ready to confess when you reveal it to us, and then ready to talk to our brother and sister. Uh, whether we've sinned against them, or whether we just need to share with them our heart and our struggles so that they can pray along with us. And we wouldn't try to put on a show as some sort of uh, superhero in front of others, but we would live broken before each other in, in need for you. God, I, I just pray that our walk would also be a walk full of joy. Lord, it's sad. We, we look around and we see people who don't know you, who don't have you. They're, they're missing something in life. But it's a shame when it's us as Christians walking around and missing out on the joy that you offer and give. Lord, may we trust in your cleansing so that we too can live lives of joy because it's all about you. Lord, I thank you for how you've been working in the hearts of different members of our church, those who have been spending some time with you. You've been working in our hearts to seek after you. You've continuously been showing some of us that this is a need 
something that we haven't been doing in it. You use this situation to awaken us, to show us and to reveal to us during this time that we need you. We need to seek you. Lord, may it be real and that it would be the new normal. Our walk with you would be consistent seeking of you and that would be our new normal. God, I also want to pray that you would work with our uh, members who are in uh, the, the, the medical field and dealing with uh, different situations. I pray that you would help them to trust in you for complete peace and joy for themselves on a personal level. And you would use them with their co-workers, with the other people there in the hospital, uh, whether it's family members or those patients that are sick, to be an example and an encouragement to them. Give them a deep love for their patients, that such a love that no one could explain. It's so beyond human level and that people around would see and notice this love. Give us also your love for lost souls. We would not see this we would not miss this opportunity to give the gospel. We would not just dismiss and focus on ourselves, but people need you. And you long to save. You long to bring people to yourself. May we look to share the gospel with others so that they too can have joy in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.